Good morning. This is Crystal Woods with Seasons in the Vine, and it's Fresh Friday. And today, we're going to talk about the wrath of Nehemiah. I was so fired up when I studied this chapter. Um, really, really, really surprised. Um, <laughs> you know, people who say the Word of God is boring aren't really reading the Word of God. Um, there is so much to learn and to just experience and see and be astonished by in the word. It's so good. And I love the Old Testament because it's just full of wisdom and it's full of prophecy. It's full of history. It's got the law in it. It's full of poetry. There's just so much goodness to take in. Um, the Old Testament is where it's at. I'm glad we don't live under that old covenant, but I do love the stories of the Old Testament. There's just so much humanity in them to really wrestle with and to see what their failings were and their successes were and to know like, wow, there's something for me in that as the Holy Spirit leads. So we're going to finish the book of Nehemiah and, um, you know, all these are on YouTube, so feel free to go back, but we have just seen the progression of Nehemiah as a ruler. Um, he has great plans. He has great vision. He is very sharp. He's very strong in his thoughts and his actions. Um, he's committed. He's not easily derailed. He doesn't get overwhelmed by the enemy. Like he's a boss. He knows who he is. He knows who God is, which is the most important thing. Like our confidence doesn't come in who we are. Our confidence comes in who he is for us, who he is on the earth, who he has always been as creator, um, as the almighty, the alpha and the, the omega. And so this is so good. So good because you got to know who he is if you're going to get your life in order. And so we are going to look at the wrath of Nehemiah. This is so cool. So let's get into it. I could talk about it and around it for a while, but let's just get into the word. On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, for they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all of those from foreign descent. So don't freak out here. Um, this is just, first, it's a, it's a history lesson. Um, that's a really awesome story uh, about Balaam. And um, you can look at Deuteronomy 23, 3 through 5 for some help on that one. But um, it's a, just amazing to uh, recall the story of Balaam. And so you should just kind of look into that. Do a Google search if you need to know where it is in the Bible. Um, and then read through it. But because of what happened there, um, they are not so supposed to be among those people. Now, it's always, always about apostasy, which is uh, turning and worshiping false gods, um, worshiping little G gods, all the other little whatever powers and principalities and whatever else is going on here that's not the true living God. And so they can't be amongst those people. So there's just some history there. So look into that history. Now, the foreign descent, um, we see measures were taken back in Ezra for that time as well. But there's no sign here that anybody had to be divorced. So if you married somebody of foreign descent, like you didn't have to divorce that person. But like, let's not continue to do this. That is... And it's, this isn't a race thing. This is a religion thing. This is a culture thing. So what happened is, is when they mixed with other people, they ended up worshiping their gods. So you know how the Bible talks about being equally yoked. So that, it's not a race thing. It's about being yoked with someone who believes like you believe. Because you will be affected by who they worship. You will be affected by their worship. You will be affected by their morals, how they see life. And the Israelites were very, very different people on the earth. They belonged to Yahweh. And that means they were very distinct from all the other people who had other gods because those gods instructed them to live or allowed certain things that Yahweh never would have allowed for his people because it wasn't good for them. That's why the Ten Commandments are really like a blessing. It's saying like, these things are good for you. If you do them, you're going to do well in life. And they just didn't live that way because they didn't have Yahweh as their God. So in that mixing, they're losing um, their devotion to the Lord. And that is what landed them in exile in the first place. Now, before this, Elishabib, 
the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God. So he was appointed to take care of the chambers of God and who was related to Tobiah. So we've got to go all the way back to when we learned about that. He prepared Tobiah for a, a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levite singers and gatekeepers and the contributions for the priest. What happened? Okay, so this Elisha gave Tobiah, the bad guy, that, that's right, it's the same name, it's the enemy, this place where the offerings were to be stored and the things that were given to the Levites, the singers and the, gates, and the gatekeepers and the contributions to the priests. So these were things that were to be given to God that were to be given to the people who were taking care of God's house. And uh, this room was then given to the enemy. Oh, that's not good. Wait till Nehemiah finds out about this. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. So he had been there for a while, but time has gone on. He originally said his prayer, and I wrote this down so I wouldn't get it wrong, in 445 BC, but now it's about 433 BC. So there's been a significant amount of time. Now we don't know exactly how long he was away from Jerusalem, but we know that sometime after the wall and he got everything established, he went back to the king um, because he was the cupbearer. And now we'll pick up the story there. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil of Elisha had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. And then I gave orders and they cleansed the chamber. And I brought back the vessels of the God, of the house of God where the grain offerings and with the grain offering and the frankincense. So he does a cleansing. Like, so he shows up into town. This is about 433 BC. So significant time has passed. All of this has gone on. There's more too. And he kicks Tobiah out. He cleans cleanses that room and he restores what is godly there. Keep that in mind. Think about your own house. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. So they're not getting what they deserve and what they need so that the Levites and the singers who did work had to flee each to his field. So now they have to go out and make their own money because they're not actually getting the provision that they're supposed to according to the law of Moses. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. He's bringing order again. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. So he's collecting what's needed. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses, Shalemai the priest, Zadok the scribe, Pedadiah of the Levites, and as their assistant, Hanan, the son of Zechur, son of Mataniah, for they were consider, considered reliable. So he's picking some people that are good people. And their duty was to distribute it to the brothers, to their brothers. Remember me, oh my God, concerning this and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of God and for his service. So basically like, hey, I'm not caught up with these fools. I'm trying to live for you, Lord, but I'm surrounded by people that are not really doing that. Like, remember me in this land. <laughs> In those days, we're in verse 15, I saw in Judah people treading wine press on the Sabbath. You gotta be kidding me. They're, they're working on the Sabbath again? Mm, mm, mm. And bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, and figs and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. No, no, no. They're acting like all the pagan nations. And I warned them on this day when they sold food. Tyrians also who lived in the city brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. So they're available for business in the holy city on the Sabbath. This is a big problem. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil thing you are doing profaning the Sabbath day? Did, your, did not your fathers act in this way and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. He's like, didn't you get it? This is why you ended up in exile. As soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. So he shut down business on the Sabbath. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. So that means they're like, well, let's have a little market outside the gates, still on the Sabbath. Mm. But I warned them, verse 21, and said to them, why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. 
<laughs> this guy is like legit. So I love this because that's why I'm calling this message the wrath of Nehemiah. He's like, if you don't obey the Lord, I'm gonna lay hands on you. Like you're gonna get it. You know how the Bible says, train up a child in the way you should go. And uh, there's some training there. These people need to be trained and it's gonna be with his hands in a minute. I love that. <laughs> From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Because basically Nehemiah's like, I'm going to take you out. Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Like, this is your job, Levites. Make sure nobody's doing anything they're not supposed to do on the Sabbath. Remember this also in my favor, O God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. Like, spare me, God, because I have been obedient. In those days, I also saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod. So this is like another god. This is another uh, foreign deity. This is another foreign type of worship. It's in the language. It's the culture. It's not Hebrew. It's not the language of Judah. And they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. So like they're, they don't even know their history. They don't know their God. This is a problem. And I confronted them. I cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. That's the wrath of Nehemiah. Like if you disobey the Lord, there's going to be punishment. And he just does it. Like he's a boss. He's representing God in this. And he's like, you have already been punished and put into exile. Why are you doing this again? Then he gives them their history. I pulled out their hair and I made them take an oath in the name of God saying, you shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters of your sons for yourselves or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? What eventually divided the nation of Israel? Solomon because he married foreign wives and he let himself be led astray and worship their foreign gods. You have to be sold out for Jesus, folks. Sold out, nothing else. Jesus plus nothing else, nothing. And we just let little things get in and it is wrong. And Nehemiah is punishing. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women among the many nations? There was no king like him, and he was beloved by God, so he had God's love, and God made him a king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? Like, stop it. Marry women that you're yoked with, the women that believe like you believe. Jewish women. And of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Elisha, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. Remember that guy? Then, Therefore, I chased him from me. <laughs> Got rid of another one. Remember them, O God. O my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. They have tainted it. And this is not okay. Thus I cleanse them from everything foreign, and I establish the duties of the priests and the Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and for the fruit, fruit, first fruits. Remember me, O oh God, for my good. Okay, I might have dropped my paper. I did. Hold on one second. Okay. So what needs to go in your life? This is the takeaway. Nehemiah comes back after time and he's like, what has happened? I didn't set it up like this. So as you've, we've been going through Nehemiah, you've been rebuilding the wall in your own life. You've been getting things in order. And now you need to make sure they stay in order. You need to make sure that you are 100% devoted to the Lord. So is there anything that needs to be cleansed from your life? Ask the Holy Spirit. Is there any wickedness still in you? Is there any sin? Is there any practice? Is there any movies, books? Is there any little or big thing that is not what God has declared to be what you should be exposing yourself to? Because I'm going to tell you something, you will fall back into the old ways if even after things are in order, you will fall back if you do not remove the temptations, if you do not remove what should not be there. So you need to do that. Follow through with Nehemiah. Get serious about it. I mean, he was a boss about this. He was ready to punish any disobedience and he did. Like, that's pretty serious. That cracked me up. He beat some of them and pulled out their hair. Like, you're going to get it. <laughs> That's what he's saying. This is crazy. So cleanse yourself in your home, your mind, and your actions. Remember, Nehemiah repented for the sins of his nation. Remember that early on, first on. He not only repented for his own sins, but for the sins of his nations. That means he knew how they got there. 
and he's saying, oh my gosh, you're gonna go back into the same thing again. If you do not stop compromising, do not compromise. Do not compromise. If the Lord in his word has said certain things are off limits for us, they're off limits. Do not compromise. You will be overcome. And I know that's a hard word, but that's a true word. So this is why they were in exile. So what do you need to do as you have just learned from Nehemiah how to rebuild, how to get things in order, how to understand the word of God and what it looks like in your life, how to be devoted totally to the Lord? Is there anything, even while I'm speaking, the Lord has highlighted? Go and deal with it today. Total cleansing. Consecrate yourself totally to the Lord because that is an acceptable offering. And that is the only that is the only offering we would give the Lord. Anything else is short of the blood of his precious son. And we can't look at the blood of Jesus and be like, Meh, I still need a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's only the blood and we owe our lives to the Lord in total purity, holiness, and consecration. So there you go, the book of Nehemiah. Wow, we learned so much. And isn't that awesome? In just 13 chapters, all of the amazing transformation that can take place as you let Holy Spirit establish these truths in your life today. I'll see you next week. I think we're doing Colossians. Going to be excited. I went back and forth between Hebrews and Colossians. We'll probably just do them both, right? I mean, there's no time limit to this unless the Lord comes back. So I will see you next week.